Morning, everybody. Welcome. Congratulations for being here so bright and early. Well done. I'm Steve Collin, the president of the New America Foundation. I'm just here to briefly welcome you and set the stage for today's discussions um, and uh, give you a little bit of a context for today's event. This is uh, another in a series of conferences and, and public convenings under uh, a partnership that New America's developed with Arizona State University and Slate Magazine uh, entitled Future Tense. And we have been putting our words in the water together for about uh, eight or nine months, and it's really been an exciting partnership. Its purpose was to try to think together these three institutions, uh, one from the West, one of the most interesting public universities in the country for a lot of reasons, but per, per, particularly because of its interdisciplinary investments in scientific and policy-relevant research. Uh, New America here, an institution in Washington that tries to, in the world of research institutions in the capital, think ahead out five to 15 years, and particularly to think about technology and how it's changing Washington's assumptions. And Slate Magazine, the first internet magazine, really a pioneer in not only the forms of publishing, but also the way magazines account for uh, change in society and in technology. And to think together about what Washington uh, may be assuming that uh, is misguided or not well enough informed by what's coming from the West or from other sources of technology innovation around the world. And we have started out thinking about how war might change as soldiers are enhanced and robots enter the field. We have thought a little bit about um, alternatives to the standard framing of the climate change debate, thinking about geoengineering together uh, at a conference earlier this autumn. And today we're here to talk about uh, life extension, radical life extension, and what um, it may hold for the actuarial assumptions that are now so central to our nation's debate. We're going to move into an election cycle in 2012 where fiscal policy and the assumptions of our entitlement system are going to be the central issue contested among the parties and the candidates. And um, most of that is based on flatline assumptions about lifespans and work, working lives in the United States that our purpose today is to, is to kind of tease out, challenge, and um, rethink because at some point, uh, Washington does catch up with the changes that technology and innovation produce. Uh, the earlier, the better, from the point of view of the citizen, I think, and the taxpayer. We had a fascinating uh, discussion about this last night and at dinner. And if I were to diagram this discussion about whether we can expect radical demographic changes in the United States and why we might expect them or why we might not, uh, I, would, I would say it was a discussion about probabilities in which there were three factors. One was the propulsion of the will to live. Another was the resistance of the collective failure of politics, that is, economic uh, failures, poverty, the persistence of chronic disease as a result of social behaviors. Um, and then the question of capacity. Even if you reduced resistance and you uh, found that people had a will to live for the longest possible time, what is the ultimate capacity? And I think uh, there's uncertainty on all three of those questions. And part of what will happen today is that uh, this diagram will be filled in with uh, expert opinion and evidence, I hope. Uh, and to kick us off, I'd like to welcome uh, Ted Fishman to lead the first panel. I have one uh, program note and then just a couple of housekeeping notes before I invite Ted up. Um, unfortunately, Francis Collins, the head of the National Institutes of Health, who was going to talk around lunchtime, has been called to the Hill uh, for an emergency um, explanation of the affairs of the National Institutes of Health, and so we could hardly begrudge his uh, late notice, unfortunately, that he will not be here. Uh, so we're just going to carry on as scheduled. Uh, through the 11.30 or noon hour. Lunch will still be available for those of you who had uh, not 
uh, made other noontime arrangements, and you'll have to construct a keynote discussion amongst yourselves, I guess, um, or appoint someone from the floor as the day goes along. Um, and uh, we are obviously broadcasting this. We're on the record together today. Um, there will be lots of periods during the conference when the floor will be open to you to ask questions um, or make observations. When that happens, please just wait for the microphone. Be conscious that, you're, um, that you have an audience outside of this room and identify yourselves and, and try to be succinct. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Ted Fishman lead us off this morning. Ted is uh, the author of a book that has um, a subtitle that's even longer than my own subtitles, and I thought I was the world record holder, but I'm going to um, give you a sense of his expertise just by reading out the full um, range of the work in his book, Shock of the Gray, shock, a shock, The Shock of Gray, Shock of Gray. Um, the Aging of the World's Population and How It Pits Young Against Old, Child Against Parent, Worker Against Boss, Company Against Rival, and Nation Against Nation. Um, Ted is uh, also the author of a best-selling book, China Inc., and he's run his own uh, trading firm and was a floor trader at the Merck in Chicago, and uh, he's written for many of the leading magazines in the country, the New York Times Magazine, Harper's, uh, GQ, and others. And I think his ability to synthesize and credibly frame the implications of demographic change, not only in the United States, but globally, has been a really important contribution to the way uh, we start with our thinking about the subject that we're going to try to deepen today. And so I can't think of a better person to moderate and organize the first round of discussion. Ted. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here. Um, the project of, of these Future Tense forums is a good one. Uh, as you all know, uh, journalism is challenged these days, and we're all looking for ways to support uh, deep investigative reporting and discussion of the issues. And uh, what Arizona State, uh, Slate, and New America Foundation are doing is so essential to this project. Um, I was interested in uh, comments on actuarial assumptions and how this uh, informs today's uh, debate. We're talking about extreme life extension, and yet when you're talking about actuarial assumptions, one or two years makes a huge difference. Uh, so people are talking about in order to save Social Security, just postpone uh, the age at which people receive it by one or two years and you could save the whole trust fund. And now we're talking uh, in this room about um, any kind of life extension, uh, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, 250 years, uh, uh, infinite life extension. Uh, so uh, think about that. Uh, one or two years makes a difference in the fate of nations. Um, uh, we're thinking far bigger than that. Last night, uh, <coughs> Stephen Johnson, who's, oh, you'll hear from later and is in the front row this, this morning, provocatively said that some of the most interesting work being done in biology today is being done in the U.S. Defense Department. Uh, he got some heat for that. Uh, I'm not qualified to say uh, how much heat he deserves on that, but it was fascinating in, in itself to say that the group – uh, that is also doing the most interesting forward work on lethality, is also doing the most forward-thinking group, is doing some of the most interesting work on longevity and, and, and biology. That's a fascinating idea. And why are they doing it? It's because there's enormous amount of intelligence around the world devoted to shortening life. And in order to combat that, you have to think about how, about uh, technologies that may eventually go into extending life. Um... So in my book, I quote Kath the American author Kathleen Thompson Norris. She has this uh, wonderful expression. She says, um, speaking actuarially, in spite of the high cost of living, it's still popular. Um, and, you know, this is one of the underlying uh, uh, tensions in this debate, which is that there's nothing humanity has craved more than life and more of it. It's the greatest gift we've given to ourselves over the centuries. Uh, ever since human beings started talking to spirits or mixing herbs uh, in a bowl, 
uh, longer life has been what we've what we've been after. And when we're thinking about all of the grave issues uh, that that we think of with an aging society, and my book has some grave sections in it, it's not all grave by any means, or we think about the fiscal challenges, we should always be weighing it against this tremendous gift that we've given ourselves, and it's an unusual gift. So Robert Fogel, the Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, wrote very eloquently on this subject uh, in a book he wrote on the great expansion of life uh, a few years ago. And he notes that there are 7,000 generations of humankind that have gone before us, 7,000 generations of humankind. And only in the last 10 generations has there been this expansion of the life, the human lifetime. So we are living in a magic moment. The, the most life-extending thing you can do for yourself is to be born around now. Uh, if you were one of the 7,000 generations that went before you, you don't have this advantage. And we have this great treasure. We have this enormous treasure. And what we're talking about today is um, uh, how to give us more of this treasure and to make the most of it. Um, there is, uh, it's interesting to be here in Washington. Sometimes when I'm in Washington, I think of this, uh, this Greek myth that comes out of the Iliad, Tithonus. You know, he is, he is a, a near deity who, as a gift of love, he was given the gift of immortal life. And so I think uh, this is often invoked in the science on longevity. Uh, but he was not given uh, immortal health. So he decays and decays and decays. And uh, think of him a little bit like Strom Thurmond. Uh, is our American Tithonus. And uh, it, it's an image that we could have in our heads as we think about these because we may not get all of the benefits that we want from extended longevity all at once. Uh, and there may be some uh, harsh realities along the way. So um, let me just go through the slides. Oh, sorry. Uh, there's my book, Shock of Gray. Uh, thanks for doing the Shaka 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 Khan uh, introduction when you were introducing it. My friends tease me about that. Um, okay, here's a, 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 a brief uh, summary of centenarians in the world. So centenarians alive worldwide in the year 2,180,000. Um, centenarians alive in early 2010, 450,000. Centenarians not alive in 2010, most of them in Japan. Uh, 230,000. You may have read about the scandal in Japan where uh, the Japanese government, which makes uh, long life a source of national pride in Japan, uh, found out that more than 200,000 of its people over 100 years old did not live. Um, and uh, uh, the expected number of centenarians in the year uh, 2050 is 3.2 million. This gives you a sense of uh, how fast uh, people at the upper age limits are growing in relation to the population as a whole. But I was thinking about why is it so fascinating about this Japanese incident where centenarians have just disappeared? Uh, and why are we fascinated with centenarians? Well, one reason it's, it's interesting is because the reason why there were no official records of these people dying is because their aged children who are in their 80s and 90s, maybe some of our 100, some of the people who are dead in Japan but still on the books as alive were 150 years old. It's because their children have vastly outlived their expected lifespan and they need the pension money from these phantom parents. Uh, there is no social mechanism in Japan uh, that adequately takes care of them and it is a a, a literally a mortal fear in Japan that you will outlive your money. Uh, it's universal around the world, but Japan has the highest rate of elder poverty in the OECD. Um, so I thought I would go through some of uh, Robert Fogel's um, explanation of why uh, human lifespan has doubled in the last 300 years in these a few generations out of the 7,000, and it's quite interesting. So we're talking about radical life extension in this room. Uh, in the literature of the conference, it said to we might live to the year 250. Well, the age 100 uh, is almost the equivalent of, if you were looking beyond 10 generations ago, telling someone they would live to 100 is almost like telling someone today that they would live to be 250. How did we, how did we get there? Um, so... Let's go to the next slide. 
Okay, so here's uh, a picture of life expectancy at birth over the last uh, uh, two decades. Um, you can see it goes from 30 to near 80 for England and France. Um, the rest of the developed world has similar charts. Uh, we all know that uh, a lot of this increase in life expectancy uh, comes from the reduction of infant mortality, right? But that's easy to overstate, too, because the kinds of lives that people led has, has, and the ways they've died has also changed radically. So in 16th century London, just to give you a hint, one-fifth of the people born in 16th century London died before the age of one. Of those that remained, one-fifth died by the age of 10. And uh, mortality went down. People were pretty hardy between the ages of 10 and 40. And then at the age of 40, uh, they started dying in large numbers again. Uh, so it's not all infant mortality. It's making it past these ages. And um, you, Guy Brown uh, at Cambridge in his book, The Living End, gives a metaphor that I really like. He, he talks about life changing from being on an on-off switch to being on a dimmer switch. Uh, so it used to be that uh, people were kind of the reverse of Tithonus. So if Tithonus lived a long life but didn't have good health, people in the past lived in good health but did not have long life. Uh, and as soon as they became sick, uh, the, the on switch turned off. So you would be <coughs> You would be vital one day, you'd have a toothache or, or step on a, a twig, get a septic uh, sore, um, uh, be bitten by a rat, by a flea, and then four days later you'd be dead. So the title of this talk has the Grim Reaper in it, and there's a reason why the Grim Reaper is the visage that he is, you know, the cowl, the cape, the blade. It's because he cut people down. He cut people down quickly. So there's two ways that people were seen of dying in the past. Um, one was in a kind of fever delirium that snuffed them out, and, and the other was this kind of last breath, <coughs> to cough and die, and that was it. So, so if we were to concoct a new uh, a replacement, a, a substitute, modern substitute for the Grim Reaper, he wouldn't be this uh, giant fellow with a blade. He might be you know, some chemist with a vial of slow-acting poison. Uh, that takes your vitality bit by bit as you move towards the later stages of, in, in life. Um, so it's amazing what used to kill people to me. Um, if Sometimes I just think about it when I go to the doctor's office and you click off the different things that you're supposed to tell the doctor that you had. These are all things that would have killed you more than 100 years ago, right? So uh, you name any disease on that sheet. You know, did you have a backache? That could have killed you. Did you have a toothache? Teeth were really, really big problems. Uh, and uh, also violent death was a, a huge uh, 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 driver of mortality at the time. Um, James C. Riley, the historian, talks about bears, snakes, fleas, wolves. Little Red Riding Hood was told to stay off the path for a reason, stay on the path for a reason. Uh, in the original version of the story, she was eaten by the wolf. She was just eaten because little girls used to get eaten by animals and killed by animals. Um, we've solved that. Um, so one of the things that uh, Fogel brings to light is the very, very a dramatic change uh, in longevity that has resulted from dramatic changes in the human diet, and these can be quite stunning. Uh, it's, it's not medicine in the way we think of it, uh, but for the first generation that began to eat well, it was the very best medicine. Um, so people used to blame high mortality, you know, in the scientific community, dem demographers, uh, in the demo and among demographers, uh, people used to blame high mortality on, on high mortality events, famines, wars. Uh, that kind of thing. And the, the more current thinking is that uh, in the past, high mortality was due uh, um, almost entirely, uh, very largely, to just chronic malnutrition, uh, being underfed. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've learned about these miniature people on the island of Flores in Indonesia. In Indonesia. Uh, and there's some debate, were they a different kind of human or were they our kind of human but were just underfed? And this is the, the view that's getting currency. They were underfed and they lived very short lives, almost entirely because of their diet and because uh, their development adjusted around their available calories. So um, uh, sometimes we trace longer life spans to just the Industrial Revolution, and it's true. Since the steam engine came around, since James Watt's steam engine, we have doubled our life, but uh, this, 
the Industrial Revolution was around for quite some time before life really started expanding in the 1890s. Uh, that was the first time where the numbers really start to tick up. Uh, and uh, there was virtually no change in how long people lived if you were working class until the 1890s. Uh, and that is also when the big diet change starts to happen. So in 18th century France, the diet of the average Frenchman, the diet of the average Frenchman uh, was just around the same as the diet of the average Rwandan in 1965. Uh, so to put that in context, Rwandans were the, are, in 1965 were among the most undernourished people in the 20th century. Uh, and that was the average diet in France at the time. Um, families in, um, people in France had just about one-fifth of the number of calories uh, to devote to their daily work as Americans eating today. Uh, that's beyond your basic biological function. So just one-fifth of the calories. Uh, it's a huge, huge change over, over uh, time to get to the diet we have today. And there's been a body change, too. You can see this in people's bodies, and Fogel also draws the, um, the, the from the evidence that you know, body change is also uh, it correlates very highly with lifespan. So, if you look at the average Dutchman today, and I see them walking around Michigan Avenue in Chicago when I'm there, and I do think that they're a different species. Uh, they're really tall, um, and I think you know sometimes I think we should put cellular antennas on them so they can just walk around and give us good phone reception. Uh, you can almost go up to a tall person on Michigan Avenue and ask if they're Dutch, you know, if they're six nine or over. And I do this sometimes, and they say, yes, how do you know? And it's like impossible to miss. Uh, if they were a zoological category, they'd be a different category. They're 12 inches taller than they were at the end of World War II. Um, and their lifespan is also significantly longer. So just counting from, the age, from age 40, uh, in 1900, a 40-year-old Dutch woman could expect to live to be 70. Uh, so this is not including infant mortality. This is just counting from the age 40. In 1991, she would reach 81. So that's an added extra year of life every decade of the 20th century. Um, so in addition to diet, what else is uh, pro prolonging life? Uh, and in Shock of Grey, um, one of the things that I was most excited to report on was uh, the impacts of public health. So here we are in Washington where um, uh, we all bemoan the fact that nothing gets done, that things go backwards, not forwards. Um, but we don't give our country, or most of us don't give any of our countries enough credit for the work that they do do in the background in public health. Uh, this is one of the most life-giving functions that humans do for themselves. So um, if you look at the best life extending strategy, you know, public health has to be up there. It provides us with better infrastructure uh, for health. Um, we have great public administration for health. When you turn on the water, it comes out clean. Um, better adaptation. People know how to use the public health infrastructure to keep themselves healthy. And we have a better understanding of public health. So if you think about Rome and the Roman baths, they, that was their version of public health. But sick people used the baths in the morning. Morning. Uh, healthy people use them in the evening, and it was just like soaking in a huge petri dish for the healthy people. But that was their vision of health. Now we have a different understanding of health. Uh, the information is is very democratized. And the other very very life extending thing that we've all given each other is literacy. You can't uh, overstate the value of literacy in extending life. Uh, think about your environment. Uh, there's health information on everything. There's health information on a gum wrapper. There's health information on a soda can. There's health information on a cigarette pack. There's health information on the signs on the bus that tell you to avoid the gap. I mean, on the subway that tell you to avoid the gap. Um, there's pamphlets that tell you about river blindness. And even if you're not literate, if you live in a city, you have proximity to literate people who have health information, and they are telling it to you. And uh, you start to get a picture of the interlocking effects of these compound uh, results of modernity, better uh, diet, uh, better access to health information, and uh, when you put all these things together, you get a contribution to longevity that's just far greater than the sum of its parts. Um, urbanization, interestingly, has been changed from 
a recipe for earlier death into a recipe uh, in many ways for longer life because you do get this proximity in slum dwellers, even in the terrible, terrible slums we know from Asia and Latin America uh, often uh, can give themselves better life just because they have proximity to information. Even if they watch TV, a soap opera where somebody is dying and you get a little bit of medical information from the soap opera, uh, you are helping your own prospects long term. So where do we go from here? Um, you see on, in the name tags and in the people sitting in the front rows here some of the uh, best minds that are working on longevity and thinking about it most deeply. I'm not going to delve into the science because we're going to get a good dose of that, but I will breeze through it. Um, so um, the role of scientists in the lab is, is changing, right, because scientists are working on understanding the deep roots of aging, uh, not, not just now on, as, as Jay Oshansky pointed out in this piece in Slate, which you should have in front of you, not just on the delay or cure of diseases that we know about, but really getting to the heart of aging. And, um, you know, this involves uh, approaching the subject on many fronts that we didn't have access to before. Uh, genetic information, which you're going to hear about, regenerative science, which we're going to hear about. But we should not lose sight of the things that we can all do, which are expanding literacy and expanding the public health. Um, one of my favorite uh, experiments uh, that I learned about when I was writing the book was, by, was conducted by Tom Rando. He's a scientist uh, who works at uh, the Veterans Hospital and at Stanford University in Palo Alto. Uh, in this experiment, he conjoined an old mouse with a young mouse. And uh, the old mouse uh, was, was sick, was old, and when they inflicted damage on the mouse, when I believe what he did was he inflicted a bruise on the mouse, he found that the conjoined mouse, the older mouse, when it was connected to the younger mouse, actually healed faster uh, when they shared a blood system. Now this is an important finding. Uh, it's an important finding because it says something about, as, as uh, uh, I learned just before, it's, it says something important about how you can bring external uh, forces into the human body that actually will retard aging. And it's a kind of window, but it's also a window to the social implications of aging. And we all have a decision to make on, on the kind of resources, who we will make instrumental in our pursuit of longevity, and these are things that we'll bring up on panel two, and I'm very excited to talk about those. We also have some challenges. Um, I'm due to speak at a convention of the National Parkinson's Foundation next month, and I was on the phone with the gentleman who was organizing it last night, and I said, what should I know about Parkinson's and aging? And he said, well, if anybody lives long enough, they're going to get Parkinson's. Uh, so if we don't solve everything all at once, we're going to have many challenges to talk about, and I think Jay's going to address these on our panel. Uh, and there's, there's a litany of diseases that if we live long enough, we will get them. Um, so I just want to go to this last slide just to clarify a misconception. A lot of the things that are talked about in Washington are about aging, but they're about population aging. They're not about human aging. And there's a difference. Populations age differently than humans than, than individuals do. We all age year by year. Um, populations age according to the rhythms of their uh, reproductive habits, um, immigration, and all kinds of things. We're going to talk about that later. But a lot of the debate in Washington is about population aging and not about longevity. And we have to separate that. Um, well, my time is up, uh, but your time may not be. Um, thank you very much, and I look forward very much to the rest of the discussion.